Good morning, friends, and happy Mother's Day. I hope you all are doing all right out there, as uh, we in California are still under quarantine. Well, let us pray, and then I will uh, introduce our sermon this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your glory and grace to us. Lord, we also want to take a special time here to thank you so much for our mothers who have uh, given us so much love and care in our lives. And I just pray that we will be appreciative of that and think deeply about the wonderful gifts you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my friends, it is Mother's Day. If I were to continue our regular preaching series, we would be talking about Noah's flood and the destruction of all flesh, and uh, we are going to be talking about that next week, and in my, in my opinion, I think it's going to be a good sermon, because it's, you know, God's word, of course, is the reason, but this morning I want to talk about mothers, and some things that God teaches us about mothers, because today is, of course, Mother's Day, and I want to take some time to honor our mothers. Now, a lot of times on Mother's Day, pastors will preach sermons um, for Proverbs 31, and they will kind of go through this long list of qualities, and sometimes Mother's Day can almost become like a guilt-tripping fest about what kind of woman, you know, you are, that sort of thing. That's not what we're going to do this morning. That's not what we are about. Today is a celebration of motherhood, and my goal today is, help, is to help us celebrate the wonder of motherhood and the wonder of the gift God has given us in the role of our mothers. My own mother was such an incredible spiritual influence on me. In fact, I would say that she was probably the most powerful spiritual influence in my life, which is saying a lot because I've had so many spiritual influences, including my father, of course, and in many sermons and many talks, I've talked a lot about my father, but the truth is when my father was out uh, hauling hay and loading hay and earning a living... My mother was the one who was often at home teaching me, teaching us. I'm not going to comment on whether you should force your kids to read your Bible, their Bibles or not, but uh, reading the Bible was a requirement in my home. And we read the King James, so from the time I could read, I grew up reading the old King James Bible. And that's something that always stayed with me, obviously, because I, uh, I grew up to become a Bible teacher of sorts. One of my earliest memories is uh, one time my mom was having a kind of a family devotional, and she had all the kids gathered in one of the rooms. We used to have, uh, we used to have, I don't know, I'm trying to think if I, if I remember this address. It might have been 475 East Hoyt Road, but we lived in Holtville, California, and we're in our little house, and my mom has all six kids in this room, and she's giving us this devotional from the book of Joshua. And it sticks with me because she said, uh, she, it was that verse where Joshua calls on Israel and says, Choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And my mom was uh, explaining to us kids, well, you, so you see, we all have to choose who we're going to serve, and in this house we serve the Lord. And the reason this is a funny memory to me is because I remember I was about five at the time and I was thinking to myself, hey, wait a minute, she can't make that decision for me. I'm going to need to think about this. And yes, that is a true story. And I did spend some time thinking about it, amazingly enough, and I don't want to go into that in too much detail. But, but uh, you know, my mom was just such an incredible spiritual influence, a discipler of her children in so many ways. And many godly men throughout history have spoken about the spiritual influence of their mother on their life. John Wesley, the, the, the great preacher of the Great Awakening, one of the great preachers at least of the Great Awakening, his mother Susanna Wesley was such a powerful influence on his life. And John Wesley said, I learned more about Christianity from my mother than from all the theologians in England. 
Now, John Wesley was theologically trained at Oxford, so this is no small statement. Saint Augustine, Saint Augustine always looked to, looked to his mother, uh, Monica, as his great spiritual influence. Saint Augustine was a wild guy for a long time, but his mother continued to pray and pray and pray for him until finally he came to the Lord. And Saint Augustine said this, he said, If I am thy child, O God, it is because thou gavest me such a mother. Spiritual influence is certainly very important in Christian motherhood. But on a deeper level, motherhood itself is supremely important. It is important because of what it teaches us about God. Let me say that again. Motherhood is important because of what it teaches us about God. In God's creation, he has given us many pictures of his own character so that we may understand things about him in these pictures in creation if we have eyes to see this. It begins with the image of God. We talked about this in one of our Genesis sermons uh, not long ago. But Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps in the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. The image of God includes humanity as male and female. And we talked about this in, in some detail when we talked about that passage in our Genesis sermons. Um, the image of God is most clearly displayed in humanity when men and women are working together in harmony for the glory of God. Because the image of God includes relationality. Our God is Trinity. One God who eternally exists in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is so important because there was a love relationship within the members of the Trinity before the beginning of time. First John tells us that God is love, which is a way of saying that love is one of the intrinsic qualities and attributes of God. How could that be so if God existed before there was any other creature for him to love? Because there was a love relationship within God himself, and that love relationship is seen most clearly in the image of God when men and women are working together in harmony. And that includes working in harmony in raising children, if you have children. Both motherhood and fatherhood give us pictures of God. In fact, I would argue that even babies give us a picture of God. That is, of course, a sermon for another day, but even a baby gives us a picture of God. But this morning, of course, it being Mother's Day, I am talking about motherhood and mothers as a picture of the image of God. And in fact, I'm also going to focus on somewhat what motherhood teaches us about discipleship. Because the role of mother actually teaches us a lot about discipleship. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. And in one sense, every Christian is a follower of Jesus, but let me put it this way, not to the same degree. Not every believer is following Jesus with the same degree of faithfulness, as we know very practically in our own experience. Being a committed disciple of Jesus, one who puts following Jesus above all other things in life, this is something that God's Word calls us to, and those who are committed disciples of Jesus should be helping others be, be disciples of Jesus, and we call this the discipleship process. You get saved one time. You become a child of God one time, and that is permanent. But discipleship, the commitment to follow Jesus, is a day-to-day -day commitment. And one of the key books for discipleship in the New Testament is the book of 1 Thessalonians. 
We usually only go to 1 Thessalonians when we want to talk about the return of Christ. You know, the dead in Christ will rise first, and, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and all that jazz, you know. That's good stuff. We want to talk about the return of Christ. But what a lot of people don't realize is that 1 Thessalonians is also one of the most important books in the New Testament about discipleship. And believe it or not, discipleship and the return of Christ are very much connected. These are companion doctrines. Because on a day-to-day -day basis, we need to be thinking about how we're living and how faithfully we're following Jesus, because Jesus could show up at any time. And whoo, there we go. What do we want to be doing when he shows up? In 1 Thessalonians, Paul describes how he and his companion Silas and Timothy went about discipling the believers in the Macedonian city of Thessalonica. I believe in modern-day Macedonia they call it Thessaloniki. Um, but he talked about how they went about discipling people in Thessalonica. And in this book, he uses many metaphors for biblical discipleship, but one of the metaphors he uses is that of a mother. The Apostle Paul says that as they helped the Thessalonian believers grow in Christ, they were like a nursing mother with an infant. The Apostle Paul compared himself and by extension his companions Silas and Timothy to a nursing mother. Isn't that amazing? Let me just read for you 1 Thessalonians 2 and verses 1 to 8. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you. Like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves. Because you had become very dear to us. Our focus this morning is verse 7, where Paul says we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Paul says that they were gentle. Friends, gentleness is a missing characteristic in so many human interactions. My day-to-day -day experience with the world, especially online, <laughs> because right now that's most of my day-to-day -day interaction with the world, it's not usually one where we see a lot of gentleness. I've noticed that Facebook has been uh, getting a lot more use lately than it had been in recent years. Very popular, you know, 10 years ago, but it kind of went dwindled. But with the, uh, you know, with the quarantine, a lot of people are back on Facebook. If you use Facebook, think for a minute about the political discussions you have seen among different friends in the last year. Gentle? I don't think so. Some of us are even part of Christian groups on Facebook and other online formats where we discuss theology, we discuss the things of God. 
I wish I could say that theological discussions among evangelical Christians are conducted in a more gentle way than people, than people discuss politics in the secular realm. And sometimes that's the case, but all too often, it's not. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness, you stupid idiot, you don't agree with my view of the rapture? Are you even a Christian? Etc. Goodness gracious, friends, gentleness is missing so much from our day-to-day -day lives, and perhaps it's because we're not always looking at the whole picture of what God wants to teach us about himself in his creation. Where might we look to learn about gentleness? Paul says his companions and himself were like a nursing mother. The phrase nursing mother suggests a mother with an infant, an infant who is still at the nursing stage of development. When I had my uh, zoology class in college, yes, I took zoology kind of by accident, but I, I got through. I had a really smart friend named Donovan Crawford who helped me study. Man, I love that guy. I, I need to call him. Donovan, if you listen to this sermon, sorry I haven't called you. I will soon. But Donovan helped me get through zoology, but I had to write a paper about some sort of a, you know, biological function, and I wrote a paper actually based on an article I found in a scientific journal about uh, mothers nursing their children. And I found out so many amazing things. Uh, uh, like, for instance, the scientist was explaining how of course, not all mothers are physically able to do this, but if a mother is able to breastfeed her children, the mother's body produces the exact nutrients that are needed for that specific infant. So an infant uh, breastfeeding with his, his or her biological mother will get the exact nutrients he needs more so than, a, than any formula that could be con concocted or, say, breastfeeding with a wet nurse or something like that. So that is just a powerful illustration of what God has given us and what this metaphor is telling us. But on a deeper non-scientific level, if you watch a mother with a newborn infant, this teaches you so much about gentleness. Now, I know there are neglective mothers. I know there are mothers who don't do motherhood the way mothers should. But friends, that is very rare with a mother and a newborn infant, perhaps more rare than almost any other situation. How does a mother treat her newborn infant? I think this has to be the best model of gentleness we see anywhere in the world. And this kind, of, this kind of establishes this relationship of gentleness that a mother has with her child, and this relationship continues as the child grows up, perhaps imperfectly, but frankly, friends, even when people grow up, so often when things start to go wrong, you want your mother. I know I do often. I'm, I, I think, you know, mom, I want mom. And that's just such a common thing. In fact, it's, it's not at all uncommon when soldiers have been killed or seriously maimed in combat. They're lying on the battlefield crying for their mother. There's a very powerful scene like that in Saving, Saving Private Ryan when they stormed the beach, beach at Normandy and a guy got his uh, leg blown off by a landmine and he's laying there clutching, clutching his leg like, mama, mama. And I suspect that's probably exactly what I would be doing in the same situation. When things go wrong, grown-up adults even often want the comfort of their own mother. And sometimes even people who do not have a good relationship with their mother yearn for one. When someone doesn't have a good relationship with their mother, or perhaps has lost a mother, this leaves a gap. And I don't, I've got to be careful speaking about these things, because I know that can be painful for some who might be listening, but this is so powerful, this relationship people have with a mother. In fact, I've seen times when people were estranged from their mother, but a certain trial brought them back together. Things get hard, and you realize, wow, whatever it was between me and mom that, that, that had us uh, at odds, I don't want that anymore because I'm going through something, and I want my mama. How were Paul and his companions gentle with the Thess Thessalonian believers? 
He writes, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Sometimes in our world we have these cliches. I remember um, an author one time arguing, explaining that the problem with cliches is that Sometimes they really express a very true sentiment, but we lose track of how important the sentiment is because it becomes cliché. And sometimes we need to return to these clichés so that we can, that we can think about the important lesson they're teaching us. One such statement is, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Think about the way Jesus brought his disciples to maturity. The discipleship process of Jesus and the Twelve. He didn't only teach them, he lived with them day in and day out for three years. My, my master's degree is called a THM, and I did a four-year program, and uh, some of my friends who did a Master of Divinity degree, uh, which is a three-year program, tease me, you know, why'd you need that extra year? Because Jesus only discipled his, disi his disciples for three years. And I suggest, you know, that we need to tally up the amount of hours we spent from him, and it probably adds up to a lot more than the hours that we spent working on our degrees. That's just a little funny, friendly banter among guys that have been to theological seminary. But the truth is that Jesus shared his lives with his disciples. Discipleship is more about teaching and spewing out facts. It is about spending time with people, cultivating relationships, and sharing lives. And again, motherhood gives us such a powerful metaphor for this discipleship. Many of us are very familiar with uh, what some have called the final apologetic. John 13, 35, where Jesus says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Friends, for us to love one another, we have to spend time together. I mean, I've got something like, uh, not, not bragging because a lot of people have more, but I have something like 1,200 friends on Facebook, I think. And you know... I hope that I love you all, but if we're talking about a real love relationship we have, you know, I probably have a, a real love relationship, a real personal relationship with about, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe 50 of those people, and, and I'm being generous to myself because it's not that we spend a lot of time together, but we do have a close friendship. But, you know, you understand what I'm saying. To love one another, we have to be together. We have to spend time together. So, motherhood teaches us about discipleship, but it also teaches us about God and the way God treats his children. The way a mother treats an infant, in particular, teaches us about how God treats his children. It is not the only thing in creation that teaches us about God, but it is an important one. Now, friends, I want to be very clear. God is Father. At High Point teach, Church, we teach that God the Father is God the Father, and the role that God has chosen to most, uh, to, to most express his identity is Father. We're not disagreeing with that, but we're also observing that God teaches us a lot of things about himself through the mother's role. And again, this goes back to the fact that the image of God is seen most fully when human beings, as male and female, are living and working together in harmony for the glory of God. God's dealings with Israel in the Old Testament are often pictured in terms of motherhood. God often uses mother metaphors to describe his dealings with Old Testament Israel. In Hosea 11, 3 and 4, he says this, Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness and the bands of love. I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws and bent them down, and pardon me, and bent down to them and fed them. 
God is describing things he did, the kind of things that mothers would have been doing with their infant and growing toddler children as the fathers were out working in the fields in the agrarian society. Isaiah 49, 13 to 15. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth mountains into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child? That she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. What God is saying there is it's, very, it's highly unlikely that any woman would ever forget a child that is still in the nursing stage of development. But even if that happened, he would not forget his people, Israel. Powerful. And God is often pictured as a mother hen caring for her, her young. This is one of God's favorite metaphors for himself and his people. A mother hen, very much like a woman nursing her own child, only a mother hen usually has a few more uh, little ones. God often compares himself to a mother hen. Psalm 17, 7 to 8. Wondrously your steadfast love, O or wonder, pardon me, let me start again. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior, of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 57, 1. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings will I take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. Now, whenever the Bible says the shadow of your wings, it's a, a, a hen with her chicks metaphor, a mother hen protecting her chicks from heat, from cold, from whatever else by spreading her wings over them. Psalm 91, 4. He will cover you with his pinions. Under his wings you will take refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. And in Matthew 23, 37, Jesus calls his lament over Jerusalem, where he, he called Jerusalem to repentance. He wanted to establish a relationship with Jerusalem as a whole, as a city. They, they resisted, and here's what Jesus said. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and sta stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus says, I, wa I wanted to gather you people under my wings. I wanted to gather you the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. You weren't willing. And when it says that Jesus wept over Jerusalem, this describes like a loud wailing. Again, friends, God is Father... But that does not mean that mothers do not teach us about his character. He treats us like a mother treats her beloved child. He gently cares for us the way a mother hen cares for her chicks. And his word tells us that that's how we need to be treating other people. We need to treat people with gentleness. And the way to learn gentleness is to look at a mother with her infant child. Friends, our goal as Christians is to show people the love of Christ, to draw people closer to God, to help them understand, if they don't, that salvation is available freely in Jesus Christ. For the non-believer, we want to show them the love of God so that they can come to experience his salvation. And for our believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, we want to reach out to them and continue to show them the love of Christ so that they can continue to grow in his love and therefore love others. This is what we do. As, as one of my, uh, you know, one of my favorite more contemporary country songs says, this is how we roll. <laughs> we roll with gentleness around here almost feel like I need a uh, spittoon or something after I say this is how we roll, but I don't do that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so, just bringing this to a head, a couple of things to leave us with. For our mothers out there who might be listening to this sermon, 
this is your day. I don't have an exhortation for you. Believe it or not, I don't have a suggestion for you. I'm not going to tell you how to go out and be good mothers. I just want to give you a word of encouragement. Sometimes it may feel like you are giving up a lot to give your children the motherly care they deserve. And sometimes we kids can be ungrateful. I say we kids because even though I'm 41, I don't have children, so in so many ways I'm still one of the kids. Phil and Linda Lexo know that so well because of the, the influence I've been on their children. Maybe not always, uh, you know, what they would hope for. Okay, I'm just, I'm just being funny because Phil and Linda know I love them and, uh, you know, their children and we've got a great relationship. All right, but sometimes you feel like you're giving up a lot for your children and you may not always see the value of what you're doing. It may not always be appreciated, but there is nothing more important in this world, mothers, than the gentleness and love you are showing their children, even when they are being unappreciative. A lot of you have given up different things to, to put the time into your children that your children need. And I just want to give you an encouragement that, in God's eyes, that is more important than any accomplishment or anything else you might have achieved, the influence you're having on your children. I don't think there's any more powerful influence on a child than the mother's influence. It's more important than anything it may feel like it is replacing. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for loving your children and teaching us what God's love is like. And even when it gets hard and even when children, be they, be they 6 or 16 or 26, even when they are unappreciative, someday something's going to happen that's, that's going to make them realize how important what you did was and how how much you gave up and how powerful you were in their lives, even when they didn't appreciate it. Keep it up. Love your children. It is so important, and thank you so much for what you're showing us and what you're doing. Men, I do have an exhortation for you, particularly married men with children. And I just want to tell you, we need to learn from our wives about gentleness so that we can show God's gentleness to them and to our children and the world around us. You know, we want to be tough guys. We, you know, we, we think about our, our heroes, our typecasts that we want to be like, our, you know, Clint Eastwood and Bruce Willis and, you know, the others. And yeah, I want to be like those guys too. And sometimes there's important times in life when you need to be a tough guy, but you need to learn what it is to be gentle, and we need to err on the side of gentleness. And that's something that God has given you, your wife and the mother of your children, as well as your own mother, going back a little further, to teach you about how to be gentle. Learn from the women in your lives. They're an object lesson on gentleness that God has given you. Not all that long ago at High Point, we were preaching about, about male and female relations. We talked about, a, you know, Colossians and, and skipped over to Ephesians a little bit. And an interesting thing, in Ephesians 5, it tells uh, husbands to love their wives, but it doesn't say wives love your husbands. And I think it's because they do it so naturally. Ephesians 6, 4, when addressing fathers, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Interesting that it addresses fathers with that and, uh, and not mothers. And I think the point with all of this is that men don't tend to err on the side of gentleness. And brothers and sisters, God is gentle with us. God has this characteristic and this attribute we see in mothers, and we need to take that seriously and learn from that. What can we learn about how to treat the world around us from the way a loving mother treats her children. My goodness, I can't tell you how many times, and, and Andrea and I don't have children, but, but we've worked with them a lot, and, and Andrea has in particular, and I can't tell you how many times some little kid was throwing like a crazy screaming fit or something, and I'm just like thinking, man, this kid's misbehaving. And 
you know, Andrea's like, well, well, he's tired. He needs, to, he, he needs to get to sleep, or he's hungry, or something that I just never would imagine because I don't have that natural gentleness and sensitivity. I need to watch, and I need to learn, and we all need to be doing that. One final point, friends. I know sometimes talking about motherhood can be very hard for some of you because some of you didn't grow up with a mother in your life, whether because of an untimely death or because of an abandonment or something like that. Maybe there's a big hole because you've never known a mother's love in that way, and I just want to tell you that the place you can experience that love is with God, because that love comes from God. And to know that love, if you've never known it before, you have to know God. God loves you. God loves you more than any mother loves any infant. He loves you so much that even though you are a sinner and your sin separates you from him, he gave you his only son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life that you couldn't live and to die on the cross for your sins, to take the punishment that you deserved, to rise again on the third day and now offer you his salvation and new life. The metaphor the Bible uses for those who come to God for salvation is that they become children of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called children of God. When you become a child of God, even if you've never experienced a mother's love, you'll experience that kind of love and beyond. And you become part of a Christian community of brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers who can love you. If you've never come to Jesus, thrown your sin before him and said, Jesus, I don't want this anymore. I want the salvation you give me. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again on the third day, and I'm putting all my trust in you for the salvation you provide. If you've never come to that point in your life, now is the time to come to it. No matter who you are, you need God's love. And God wants to shower his love upon you. Like a hen with her chicks, like a mother with her infant. Come join us in the family of God today. Now is the time. Let's close in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you. We're, thank you. we're thankful for our mothers. Most of all, we're thankful for your love, your gentleness, and I pray that it will become a model for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, just a reminder, if you want previous sermons or Bible studies, uh, our sermons are at highpointsd.org. You can also check out my personal YouTube page, Peter Vick, last name V-I-K. And as soon as uh, we are allowed to open up, we will be having Sunday morning services here at High Point Church at 10.30 a.m. and our Wednesday night Bible studies at 6.30 a.m. We also have a, uh, a youth group with our youth leader, Nick Berto at 6.30 on Wednesday nights. Love to get any of your kids involved when that is uh, possible. Really good things were going on at High Point before the quarantine began. Good things will be going on after it ends, and we would love to have you come uh, hang out with us. Until next time.